In the battle between democracy and autocracies, democracies are rising to the moment, and the world is clearly choosing the side of peace and security. This is the real test, and it's going to take time. So let us continue to draw inspiration from the iron will of the Ukrainian people. As the crisis in and over Ukraine deepens, its humanitarian effects widen and its economic fallout spreads across the world. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. As the crisis in Ukraine continues to escalate with mounting casualties and well over a million refugees, the U.S. administration is redoubling its drive to rally international support for its policy. President Biden announced more sanctions aimed at isolating Russia and its leadership, while the U.S. Congress considered a significant new aid package to Ukraine, building on the billions of dollars of lethal military and other assistance the U.S. has already provided to Kiev. In the past year alone, the U.S. has provided more than a billion dollars in military support to Ukraine and more than 2.5 billion since 2014, when Ukraine's President Viktor Yanukovych, who had opted for closer ties with Moscow rather than the EU, went into exile in Russia. Now, while other countries have sent weapons, the U.S. remains Ukraine's largest military purveyor, most recently allowing the provision of shoulder-fired anti-aircraft stingers. Now, the current military assistance package the U.S. is considering for Kiev amounts to $6 billion. That figure is likely to increase as the war deepens and widens across the country. If Ukraine's regular forces stand little chance against Russia in a conventional conflict, as military analysts suggest, does the military aid being sent to Kiev raise the specter of a protracted war that will inevitably lead to more casualties and destruction? And could the current conflagration have been avoided altogether had the U.S. and other NATO members paid serious attention to Russia's explicit and vocal security concerns. Joining me now is Alexander Vindman, a retired U.S. Army lieutenant colonel and former director for European affairs at the U.S. National Security Council. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, you served as the top Ukraine expert on the U.S. National Security Council under President Trump, who, who fired you after your testimony before the U.S. Congress during his first impeachment hearings. As someone who spent 21 years in the U.S. military, as a Ukrainian-American, how do you see the Ukrainian crisis unfolding? Well, I see this being a very, very dangerous moment for the United States, uh, for the uh, NATO alliance, uh, for the Euro-Atlantic alliance, and really for the world. We have to remember it's the largest country in the world attacking the largest country in Europe. And the, the likelihood of this becoming a spillover beyond those uh, those two countries is really, really high. And so therefore, I, I continue to be really concerned about the developments on the ground and uh, how this could drag in the United States reluctantly or NATO reluctantly into a, a much, much bigger war. Could we see a much bigger war that drags in the United States and NATO in a direct confrontation with Russia? And in fact, there are many who already speak about the possibility of us uh, going into or already being in World War III. In fact, one of your colleagues, uh, Fiona Hill, former Russia expert on the U.S. National Security Council, thinks we already are in World War III. Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, Lavrov warned in no uncertain terms that World War III will be nuclear. This is quite dangerous. Where is this all leading? It, it is very, very dangerous. And the longer this goes on, the more dangerous it gets. I think the things that seemed completely unreasonable uh, even a 10 days ago are now are now uh, looking slightly more likely. And I think our mindset hasn't really caught up to the fact that we're, we're now in a different world. We're now in a world where we're in a cold war with Russia and the objective is to stay out of a, a hot war. And that's why um, more thoughtful actions, even actions that uh, have uh, uh, seem like they're uh, slightly high risk now could be low risk in the future because options are, are going to get progressively worse. Let's look at what's going on right now, though. I mean, Russia has invaded Ukraine. The U.S. and NATO had been warning about it for months. They were eventually proven right. But if one looks at it objectively, doesn't the U.S. and NATO share a large part of the responsibility? Could they not quite easily, one could argue, uh, 
have avoided this war? I mean, the conflict was simmering for many years, wasn't it? We did not do enough to avoid this. It was coming, and we had this defeatist attitude that Russia is a nuclear power, and we're deathly afraid of a nuclear escalation. And on that basis, we did not give Ukraine sufficient support. Uh, even the Turkish government was prepared to supply Ukraine with these um, Bayraktars, these TB2s that have been effective. But the rest of NATO, the U.S., ha hasn't done that. So it made it seem like the, the West and NATO were, were disinterested or too concerned about an escalation to provide adequate support to Ukraine to avoid this confrontation. On that basis, I think you're right. Uh, I wish we had followed uh, Turkey's lead and, and done more to make it unpalatable for Russia to conduct this, uh, 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 this, this war, this um, naked war, because uh, now we're in a situation where options are, are worse. But, but, but beyond that, did the United States, did NATO miscalculate by pushing for the expansion of the alliance eastward at all costs, knowing that it had been for a long time a red line, not just for Putin, but for every other Russian and Soviet leader? I mean, do you, do you believe that the West, especially the US, should have understood that its Ukraine policy was laying the groundwork for a major clash with Russia? It's, it's, we, we sometimes think as Western countries or as other powers that we have uh, a disproportionate or um, an inflated view of, of, the, of our roles in, in these affairs. In fact, it's about Ukraine. It's about Ukraine and Russia and about the fact that Ukraine was making progress towards uh, integration with the EU. That was the decisive factor. N NATO enlargement, even by Putin's own words, words historically, was not a consideration in, when he first took power in the early 2000s. It was the fact that Ukraine and Georgia were making progress in integrating with the, the West and, and slipping through Russia's sphere of influence that caused Russia's belligerence in Georgia and in Ukraine. NATO enlargement, if anything, secured countries like Turkey, countries like Romania, Poland, against uh, uh, the, and the Baltics in particular, the small countries in the Baltics, against Russia's uh, irredentist um, you know, desires, aspirations for uh, empire. Uh, it's but, but, but again, though, by trying to bring Ukraine into its fold, closer to the European Union, closer to NATO, wasn't that uh, a major uh, uh, root yeah. cause of what we're seeing now? I mean, and so what is the solution moving forward? Should the U.S., should sure. the West think about Ukraine in a fundamentally different way and abandon its plans, or rather, I should say, its, it's public pronouncements? to integrate I, Ukraine into NATO? Excellent question. I think there was a mistake made in, in uh, Bucharest in 2008. We went too far. So we, uh, the, uh, we were provocative towards the Russians, but we didn't go far enough. We didn't give um, Ukraine a membership action plan that left it vulnerable. So that was probably an ill-conceived approach. But yes, hold on, hold on. But the United States did push for that statement at the end of that Bucharest summit that said that Georgia and Ukraine would become members of, of, of NATO. Was right. that a mistake? The Germans and the French were against that it. That was a mistake. Yes. We went too far, but not far enough. We went so far to be provocative towards Russia, but we didn't give Ukraine or Georgia the security of a, of, uh, of a NATO security blanket. But you asked your second part of your question was, should we rethink uh, our relationship with Russia and Ukraine? For, I, I'm working on my doctorate at Johns Hopkins. It's on US foreign policy towards Russia and Ukraine since 1991. And my conclusions are, we put too much stock in the relationship with Russia. We had um, hopes that we would be able to accomplish more than we could with Vladimir Putin. And uh, Vladimir Putin, a KGB case officer, preyed on those. And we had fears of a, a rela relationship with Russia devolving towards confrontation. And instead, what we should have done is we should have worked with places like Ukraine, where we had a willing partner, where we could accomplish more. You've also blamed Moscow's actions, its, its invasion and ground war, on U.S. policy over the last 20 years. But specifically, you say uh, it was much to do with the Republican Party and Trump, who praised Putin's quote-unquote genius in the run-up to the invasion. You yeah. accused them. Uh, of emboldening Russia to invade Ukraine. You go as far as to say they have blood on their hands. But your claims seem to shortcut history. Again, NATO's expansion predates Trump, when Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary joined NATO in 1999. It's President Clinton, in fact, who first broke the understanding reach with the Soviet Union prior to German reunification that NATO would not expand an inch eastward, isn't it? So to blame it all on, on Trump, 
really shortcuts history, doesn't it? Uh, the gist of your question is, you know, uh, who, uh, where does the blame fall? I would describe it as this. We've been slowly keep, uh, creeping towards a confrontation with, with uh, Putin for years because the, the, he's believed that he, he could operate with impunity. He could double down, he could be more aggressive, and he could face little resistance uh, and little challenge. So if you imagine a snail kind of, you know, moving along slowly. But when you get to the Trump administration, you lurch forward towards this confrontation. And the reason is, that if the previous presidents, uh, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, were, were not uh, were, were uh, focusing on the wrong relationships and also subject to hopes for a better relationship and fears of a devolving relationship, under Trump, you have a different paradigm. Under Trump, you basically have somebody that is uh, um, cheerleading for Vladimir Putin and bringing the Republican Party to to not take the traditional position of, you know, firmly standing up for freedoms and uh, American values, but to rally behind Donald Trump in his support of author or, uh, an authoritarian leader, a tyrannical leader. So you, you, you know, this could have ended up under a different presidency. We could have ended up with a confrontation somewhere down the road. Let me finally ask you if you believe the the two hundred year old Monroe Doctrine is still central to U.S. policy. Would the U.S. allow Mexico, Cuba, Venezuela, or Canada, for that matter, to have Chinese or Russian bases, including nuclear missiles, stationed on their territory? But, but that's not happening. That's a completely false premise. And Turkey and Venezuela, I mean, and Cuba and Venezuela clearly are in the Russian sphere of influence, and we have not decided to, to bomb them or take over those territories, right? So you, you say that isn't happening, but, but Russia is being encircled by... NATO artillery by, by missiles, by, by I, I would weaponry. Describe it as, I would describe it as Russia is the largest country in the world, and I'd describe it as Russia's land masses encircling NATO. Just look at the map and how much of, uh, uh, how much of Russia uh, is outside of the NATO sphere, the vast majority of it. There's a small fraction that's, uh, that's abuts against NATO. And the, there hasn't been a NATO expansion in, uh, what, 15 well, well, years? Well, the Russians, Russians say they feel threatened having NATO member states position all this weaponry right at their doorstep. But then, to your argument, why what not weaponry? then? Why what not weaponry? then announce there publicly as a policy there. that Georgia and Ukraine will not join NATO? Anyway, no one believes that they will anytime soon. Why not, why not just say it well, and for remove one thing, this issue? For one thing, uh, it is always a terrible idea to negotiate at the point of a gun. And the Ukrainians had a gun to their heads, figuratively speaking. So that's, uh, and the second premise is that somehow this would alleviate or um, uh, remove this prospect of uh, Russian war. That is not true. It has now been proven completely hollow that this is about NATO. This is all about Ukraine. This is all about Russia's aspirations with Ukraine. All right, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, great to have you on the program. Thanks so much. Thanks. I appreciate the, the conversation. Now, as world markets see sharp increases in the price of oil and natural gas, President Biden has authorized the release of 60 million barrels of oil from the U.S. strategic reserves to calm jittery markets amid calls for a boycott of Russian hydrocarbons. While the U.S. and other countries have avoided direct sanctions on Russian oil and gas companies, some in the U.S. and Europe are calling for more severe sanctions against Russia's economy, including an embargo on its oil and gas supplies. But sanctions aren't just hurting the Russian economy, with the price of oil, natural gas, wheat and other commodities surging by 20 or 30 percent on world markets. So where will this all lead as the global economy was beginning to recover after two years of a punishing pandemic? Can the U.S. and other Western countries maintain their unity in the face of mounting financial pressures, an energy crisis, and growing inflation. And how much responsibility does the West in general, and the US in particular, bear for the escalating conflict and tensions surrounding Ukraine? Joining me now is Ambassador Roman Papaduke, who served as US Ambassador to Ukraine under Presidents George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton. Ambassador Popaduk, you were the first U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. In fact, you took up your position in 1992 following the end of the Cold War and the unraveling of the Soviet Union. To many people looking at the crisis today, it, it is no secret that ever since Ukraine became independent, 
Washington had tried to bring it closer and closer to the West, knowing full well that from all of the former Soviet republics, Ukraine and Russia shared the most. They had the most in common. So my question is simple. Why? Uh, Gita, first of all, thank you for having me on the show. I'm delighted to have this discussion with you and to try to shed, shed some light on it. Uh, if I take your question uh, accurately, why did Washington try to bring the bring Ukraine toward the West is the premise of your question. Uh, I think it was very important in the sense that uh, Washington tried to bring all countries, not so much to the West as into the international order of democracies and market economic uh, reform. And so we extended that kind of opportunity to all the former republics of the Soviet Union, including Russia. But, but let's be honest, though, this was never really about supporting democracy. I mean, it seldom is. It's about power politics at the end of the day, isn't it? It's about keeping Russian influence in check. I mean, the Cold War might have been over, but still very much alive. To this day, in fact, we can see it in the minds of U.S. policymakers, in the minds of the U.S. establishment. As I said earlier, our efforts were not only to try to bring the former republics into the uh, international community for Russia as well. So while there was uh, obviously a desire to keep stability in the region, that stability rested on making sure that all the states uh, cooperated and that uh, the United States cooperated with those states. And we found that the best way for that kind of cooperation is to every, for everyone to share a common destiny of political reform domestically and economic reform as well. But, but from a strategic point of view, uh, looking at the long-term interests of the United States, some believe the U.S. and, in fact, its European allies have a sizable share of the responsibility for the, 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 the current crisis. They say the root cause of the trouble is NATO enlargement, which the Russians have vehemently opposed. In fact, since the mid-1990s, when the Clinton administration began pushing for NATO expansion. Do, do they have a point? Number one, NATO is a defensive organization. Secondly, NATO uh, uh, extended its uh, organizations to Russia also for transparency's sake. Now, to go to the heart of your question, I think what you're looking at at the current situation is that Russia is using NATO as a pretext for its actions against uh, uh, Ukraine. As I mentioned earlier, uh, NATO is a defensive institution. But I'm oh, hold on, hold on, Ambassador. Here. Though, is yeah. it really a pretext, though? Because the West have been moving into well, Russia's front yard and threatening its strategic security. I, Russia warned. More than I understand once. you were in the administration then. Was it a major mistake? I, I understand you. A, a, a crucial Let me get to my point. It, it's a pretext for the simple reason that no one currently is thinking of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO in the short term or in the long term. And you also have to look at the relationship between Ukraine and Russia. I think Russia saw, sees Ukraine in a different light than the way you're portraying it. I think Russia sees that U Ukraine on its own volition is moving toward the West that Ukraine on its own volition is building up a conventional military force, and Russia on its own volition is becoming a democracy, a growing democracy. But, but, but you said it though, you said that no one is seriously thinking of Ukraine becoming a member of NATO anytime soon. So why doesn't the US and NATO abandon these public statements of making it seem like Ukraine will become a member of NATO anytime soon? Why not remove this well, provocation the, the, in the, the eyes of the Russians? The answer is very clear, Gita. Uh, first of all, no state should have a, a veto power over the desires or goals of another state. If you let Russia have a veto say on who can, be, who can or cannot become a member of NATO, where else are they going to want to have their influence felt? And that's something that I think uh, no one uh, group of countries would like to have one country have that kind of veto power. George Kennan, who I'm sure you hold in great esteem, said in 1998, in fact, shortly after the U.S. Senate, approved the first round of NATO expansion. He said, quote, I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think this is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anyone else. He was right, wasn't he? Russia waited patiently, one could argue, without condoning its military offensive for two decades. Shouldn't Washington have listened? To Canon. It was only when Russia started feeling the threat of Ukraine's development and movement toward the West on its own volition that Ukraine became an issue. And I think in that context, they're using the expansion of NATO as a pretext for their actions against Ukraine. Well, well so Ukraine I, was always going to be an issue, Ambassador. I mean, you know it from your discussions with Russian leaders, Soviet leaders as well. It was a red line for them, both Georgia and Ukraine. 
joining the alliance. It was quite different but, to all of the other yeah, countries. I, well, I think we're looking at this from two different sides, Higira. Uh, I don't see the NATO expansion that took place as a threat to Russia. And I don't see any uh, efforts on the part of the NATO letting Ukraine in at this time. I think what happened is that the, the Russians felt that the, as I mentioned before, uh, before, that Ukraine was moving too quickly toward the West on its own volition and was gonna come out of their sphere. And there was a great fear on their part to, do, to make sure that Ukraine stayed in their domain. The crisis has also cemented this much closer relationship between Russia and China. These two powers uh, who have their own share of rivalries and tensions. Is this the big geostrategic shift that has now appeared as a result of the crisis over Ukraine. I mean, shouldn't this give pause to Washington and push the U.S. to find a workable solution to the war, to maybe finally realize that in a world of real politique, Russia's security can't simply be brushed aside? Well, I think, I think you hit the nail on the head here that, uh, if, to use your words about Russia and China, the Ukraine issue goes beyond just Ukraine and Russia. It involves China in the sense of the Chinese support of Russia, or perceived support of Russia, I should say. Obviously, there's a closer uh, unity between Russia and China on a number of issues. And uh, Russia, uh, Russia has been relying on China to at least uh, acqu uh, to, to acquiesce in some of the activities that they're undertaking, and particularly in terms of uh, its actions in, in, uh, in Ukraine. But uh, you have to also realize that China has its own interests. And uh, those interests will not be sacrificed in order to placate or help Russia. China will act in its own interest. The United States fully realizes that. We have a strong policy aimed toward working with Russia and particularly in trying to stop this aggression, uh, to stop this aggression in Ukraine. But also our relationship with China is uh, separate from that from Russia. We're acting with the Chinese on a variety of issues and we're quite aware of the, of the risks and challenges that Ch China poses not only in the area of Asia, but also worldwide. Could peace, in your mind, in Ukraine be achieved through a peace plan, a treaty that would guarantee Ukraine's security and integrity as a neutral state uh, like Austria after the Second World War? That's a very good question. Uh, obviously, the sooner the uh, conflict ends, the better it is. One hates to see the spread of, the spread of bloodshed and people dying and there's hopes for a diplomatic solution. However, the bar for a diplomatic solution at this time is very high. You have to realize from what I understand, you know, the Russians may be asking for recognition by Ukraine of Crimea, of some, um, there's the issue of the Donbass also. And then this issue as you raise on neutrality, whether Ukraine be willing to declare itself a neutral state. These are all dictates that the Russians may want to impose on Ukraine. And uh, that's for the Ukrainian government to decide in its own right. But, the issues, for example, are very tough. And a good example is whether or not Ukraine will be willing to recognize Crimea as being part of Russia. All right, Ambassador Roman Popaduk, thank you so much. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you for having me. Have a good day. The tragedy unfolding in the Ukraine did not start with the so-called Russian special military operation, a full-scale invasion by Russia of a former sister republic in the USSR. The human tragedy started with the brutal war raging for eight years now in the Donbass region. But the West turned a blind eye, because in its narrow view, it was already a conflict with Russia's proxies, which would keep Russia at bay and alienate Kiev from Moscow. The premise of today's full-scale war, with multiple fronts in Ukraine, as well as the unresolved conflict in Georgia, cannot be dissociated from the fateful NATO Bucharest Declaration of 2008 on further eastward expansion of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Although that declaration was decried by many, including foremost experts and officials in the United States, Washington stayed the course, a collision course that is now in fact already pitting NATO against Russia. NATO has not formally entered the war, but the war has already entered the alliance. For now, nuclear deterrence is working, but will it prevail? Are we immune to a computer glitch or a cyber attack? In just a fortnight, the military and economic wars over Ukraine have sent shockwaves through world markets, and not just for natural gas and crude oil. The price of wheat has also hit new heights. And so in short, to paraphrase George Kennan, what we have today is the US on a collision course with Russia, 
with its captain steering the Titanic towards the iceberg, refusing to change course because the iceberg should back off, move aside. But not even NATO can change geography and the weight of European history marred by centuries of war and, of course, two world wars. But today's world is a small, interconnected cyber bundle inside a nuclear keg. The incident at the Zaporizhia, Ukrainian nuclear power plant last week, should be, for both Presidents Putin and Biden, a wake-up call to step back from the abyss. President Zelensky warned we could have had six Chernobyls in just an instant. Imparting blame or grandstanding would then be just as meaningless to Ukrainians and their neighbors in and outside NATO as it was to the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's all from Miri Dafakhri and the team. Thanks for watching.